Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the very first episode of what will likely be a recurring series with me, Justin, and Diego over here. And we will be talking about exploring UI, UX in Monero. That's user interface, user experience. And the focus for this series will be mostly me just guiding Diego through this process because he, Rirar, is really the expert here and there's a lot that the Monero community can learn and the rest of the open source community can learn about how to best handle UI UX for really complicated things. Um, and it's really a topic that is often ignored. So Diego reached out to me and said, hey, this is something I'm really interested in doing uh, for the Monero community and for everyone else. And so here we are kind of spur of the moment to record and, and listen to Diego's uh, thoughts here on the matter. So just really brief introductions if Diego wants to introduce himself more, he may, especially related to UI UX, but the two of us are the organizers of the Monero Community Workgroup, and Diego is especially focused on making the UI UX of Monero and its related ecosystem projects a lot better. So with that introduction out of the way, I'd like to hand it off to Diego to talk a little bit about himself and then jump into what he really wants to get out of the series. Sure. Thanks for joining hey. us. Hey everybody, my name is Diego Salazar. Most people on the Monero community know me as Rarar. Um, I do a good number of things for the community. You know, like I help run the community work group and, and uh, I travel and speak about Monero sometimes. Uh, I do some website work and then I also own a small, you know, just personally, I own a small design firm uh, and we do UI UX uh, for different companies and we also, uh, you know, web work and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, user interface, user experience is something that is really, really fun for me. Um, I consider myself, you know, don't, don't roll your eyes just yet. I consider myself an artist. You know, I really enjoy uh, making music, writing music, you know, play guitar, play the piano, um, other forms of art. I enjoy writing stories. You know, I, I've written uh, two novels. And uh, so just, there's a lot of artistic creativity flowing in me, but I also really enjoy science. I, you know, got a degree in biology. I worked in a couple of different laboratories and I, I really enjoy the scientific process and the critical thinking that goes along with that and experimental design. And the cool thing about UI UX is that it's really just this combination of art and science and in, in a way that is very fascinating and very fun for me. Uh, so, you know, kind of as soon as I, I stumbled upon this world of, of user interface, user experience, I started learning everything I can, watching a lot of things from different people, you know, both from, uh, more traditional coursework to uh, non-traditional kind of uh, people just explaining their process and and looking through different uh, user flows and scenarios. And uh, we're going to get a little bit more into why this is important later, but I've always been very good with people. And it, it's very important in UI UX to understand people, the psychology of people, how they work, why they work, and, and how they're thinking in, in different scenarios. So um, first, I'd like to just uh, take a step back, and so that you know, that's a little bit about me and why I enjoy this type of thing. And uh, so I'd like to take a step back and kind of give a little bit of a framework for where we're going to be going, um, not just in this episode, but in future episodes. Uh, you know, in this episode, we're going to kind of look at UI UX in general. What is it? Why is it important? Uh, what sorts of things can it offer? Uh, technology, the open source community, and Monero. Um, so we're really going to be looking at just kind of the generals and, and setting some foundations here. Uh, in future episodes, we'll be looking strictly kind of at technology and open source software and kind of the state of UI UX in those areas. Um, after that, we'll be moving kind of into cryptocurrency um, and kind of the state of UI UX there before finally touching on Monero. Um, and it's important to set all of these, this, this pyramid of frameworks because a lot of these discussions about UI UX in Monero are going to be dependent on a lot of the things that I'm going to be teaching and we're going to be learning um, throughout in this, in this area. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that, I'd like to just kind of start as any basic, you know, college course or whatever would when we're discussing anything. It's like, this, this is where I put on my PowerPoint thing and I say, what is blank? And that blank is just the name of the course that we're taking. Um, so in this case, what is UI UX? What does it mean? Um, and this is usually where you're going to get some nonsense from the professor like blank means different things to different people and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it, to, to some extent, this is true. But UI UX, you know, what it literally means is user interface and user experience. And to a lot of people, these two things are interchangeable. You know, when we're talking about the UI of something or we're talking about the UX of something, a lot of times they're interchangeable to most people. They'll say UX 
but they're really talking about kind of the the thing that the user is interacting with and so they're not i guess they're not really the same um the ui the user interface is the thing that the user is interacting with. It's all, it's the thing that the user has interaction with. Um, so it could be the words on the screen. That is something they're interacting with by reading it. It can be a button that they click to move to a different part of an application or a, um, a website. Um, and that's something that they have to interact with. But how do they click that button? Maybe it's with their, um, if they're on their phone, they tap it. So their screen is something. It's part of an interface. Uh, the mouse that they use to click it with, that's, you know, that's, um, it's its a tertiary part of the interface. It is still part of the interface. So there's, there's anything that the user is interacting with is a part of the UI. Now that, because that's so broad in the realm of, you know, applications or stuff, we try to narrow that down because if I develop an application, I can't control what mouse somebody is going to use or potentially what phone they're going to be browsing it with. So I all I have control over is the interface of my application. But it is important to realize that everything that we design, everything that we create is actually a part of a broader ecosystem of people using things. And you, you will often see where somebody will have a mouse problem and they'll be frustrated and they'll attribute it to the app or something. So that you'll get support issues that like I can't solve this for you, man. This is part, this is your computer. This is your hardware. This is your whatever, right? And this isn't, this isn't me. So it, it's important to realize just the broader ecosystem of the interface. Um, so that, that's kind of UI. It's the interface, anything the user is interacting with. The user experience, it's in some ways, it's actually a little easier to comprehend. In some ways, it's a little harder to comprehend. Um, the user experience is just everything that the user is is the experience that they're having while they're using whatever it is that we've made for them to use. Um, as an example, something that is probably the, the easiest, the most accessible thing to understand is loading times or wait times. Let's say we have an application and you double click it on your desktop and it um, it shows up and you type in your password and now you're getting in but it takes 30 seconds to kind of load the inter to load the whole interface. In this time, we wouldn't say that it's a UI issue because the user's not really interacting with anything, but they're having a frustrating experience because they're rolling their eyes, they're twiddling their thumbs, they're waiting for this application to actually start and to actually get to a place where they can interact with the interface. So this is something that is part of the user experience, but not necessarily directly part of the interface. It could be the most beautiful interface in the world. So intuitive, so wonderful to navigate. Everything is self-evident. But if that loading screen takes a really long time, the user experience is going to suffer for it. <clears throat> so there's a lot of these areas that we're going to be talking about in terms of user experience that are not going to be dealing with the interface itself or anything, that, any input that the user has to put into the system. Um, so that's kind of the, the separation of UI UX, but they often do go hand in hand. You know, if, if there is a frustrating to use interface, things are not self-evident, then the experience is going to be poorer as a result of that. Um, and actually in, in reverse, if a lot of the other things about the user experience is good, you know, things are snappy, they're responsive, they work well, uh, users may be willing to overlook some interface issues. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, those shouldn't be fixed. Okay, Justin raised his hand, he wants to speak. Jitsi yeah. has that cool little feature. So what's up, Justin? I just wanted to quickly uh, make a distinguishing point. So would you say that UX is essentially a super type for UI, where UI is one component of user experience, or yes. is, it, is it different than that? No, it, that's, that's, definitely, that's definitely a good way to put it. At the very base you, is the user experience, and the interface is one of the things that feeds into the user experience. From a designer's point of view, the interface is the thing that they have control over. Right. So when we think about designers, um, we typically think of UI UX people because now nowadays people come and they uh, they don't specialize. You know, I do UI and UX type thing, um, meaning I can create this design, this this interface, and I work on things like flows and, and how to get to places and stuff like that. But um, there are some people that are just UX people, and there are some people that are just UI people. So, um, so they. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it, Justin, is that UI ultimately feeds into the ultimate user experience experience. So um, yes, well, well put, well put. Um, and for people that are interested in this type of field, you know, if what I said about kind of art and science, and, and I'll give some examples about why it's both artistic and scientific. 
Um, but if what I said about that interests you, there's a lot of free resources on the internet to kind of learn more about UI UX. And I encourage actually everybody to learn a lot of the basics, the foundations of user experience, um, just because there is so much that we can gain, even like if you're a developer, if you're, you know, if you're a coder, if you're a marketer, there's so much that you can learn just from, uh, from user experience, because really it's, it's about how people think it's about how people do things. Um, and I think one of the things I really want to highlight about UX is this idea of empathy, this, this idea that when I create something, when I create a flow, when I create a system, when I create an application, when I create anything, I'm doing it with other people in mind. And these people will necessarily be different than me. They're going to be different than me. They're going to have different ideals, different worldviews, different ways of, of approaching new subjects or, or new applications. I'm building for these people. It may be that I'm building something for myself in which I'm the user that I'm thinking about. Okay, great. Um, but if I ever, if I push it to the public and I want people to like it and I want people to use it, then I have to b expand beyond myself. Now, for some people, this is quite difficult. Some people, empathy does not come naturally. Um, and those people generally know who they are, you know, um, and it's difficult because empathy is also not something that is easily taught. You can't, it's, it's very hard to teach people how to theoretically enter somebody else's shoes and see how they would look at the application or the world or anything like that. It, it's something that's not easily taught. And I don't think anybody really has a good answer for how to teach empathy. Well, there are some attempts and I don't know if you have any good ideas, please, please let me know. I'd be very interested. But empathy is very important because when I'm designing something or when I'm making flows, I'm thinking, okay, there is this person, this hypothetical person that I'm making it for. And he has these sets of skills. Maybe he's technologically illiterate. Maybe he's more literate than most. Maybe, um, maybe he's colorblind. Maybe you know, uh, with uh, disability issues. There, there's people, and I have to think. I have to get in their shoes, get in their minds. Okay, how are they going to be viewing this application? Is this going to be confusing for them? Is this not going to make any sense? And you know, we we see a lot of poor um, empathy in open source software circles where. Um, people have a very high logical quotient, but maybe not a very high um, interrelational quotient. So they design flows and and interfaces that are good for themselves and people like them. You know, other, um, I say this term affectionately, uh, other nerds, right? People who are able to understand these flows. But then when they when they expose it to the public and the, the response is less than stellar, you have, you have responses like, go read the manual. Come on, like you just... You, you got to figure this out. You know, I figured this out. Okay, but not everybody thinks like you. Not everybody thinks like me. So we would say that these things have a poor user experience for the general public. They may have a good user experience for people that are used to this type of thing, you know, for other nerds. Great. And, and if that's your target audience, then that's totally fine. And it's it's very important to kind of narrow your 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 target audience. Who am I who am I trying to make this for? And if I am trying to make it for a very specific group and that group gets it, and other people don't, then I still have succeeded because that group was the, the one that I was actually targeting. <clears throat> Things get a little bit more difficult when you're in something like Monero, where we're like, we want money for everybody. We want Monero for everybody. So we are intentionally broadening our scope to everybody, which is very difficult because culturally things are going to be different. Colors are going to be different for different cultures and countries. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just there's so much difference, generational difference, uh, cultural differences, um, gender differences. All these, all these differences are gonna come and 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 play here. So when we're like, oh, this is for everybody, you can't really. It's a very hard to, uh, audience to to shoot for, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and and we're gonna definitely be talking about that here pretty soon. Justin, what do you got, man? Yeah. So uh, one common pushback that people get for UI UX for open source projects is, hey, this is my pet project, or hey, I have very limited resources, and I'm just trying to make something that either is something that I like because I'm making it for myself, or is something that I will dismiss because I ultimately don't have the time to go work on this. I only know how to make a basic UI UX. So how, in open source, I understand that for certain things, that's fine for certain things where someone is literally just building something for them that you know, like 
it's my thing. I'm making it available to others to potentially use. How do we encourage these people to not necessarily expend a lot more resources and effort, but how do we make it so that they're more cognizant of initially designing applications in a way that is more accessible, more open to a, a broader audience? Is that how do we how do we encourage that uh, really within open source? And and this is I guess the, the answer to that question is what I said a little bit earlier. I encourage everybody to um, learn the foundations of user experience because if everybody has a baseline of knowledge about these concepts, if everybody has a baseline of knowledge, then the the ecosystem quality in open source is going to rise a couple of levels higher than it currently is. And at that point, it's going to become kind of common practice as if you're a new open source developer, they're like, yeah, um, we encourage you to know the language pretty well that you're going to be type that you're going to be coding in. But we also, you know, would encourage you to learn this uh, UX foundations. If that becomes a part of the culture and kind of where everyone is expected to at least know the foundations before they come in, then that sets a new baseline that sets a new um yeah, a new baseline of knowledge for people. And I think that overall, over all of the open source software, um, it's going to raise all the ships. The rising tide will raise all of the ships a little bit, right? And then from there, things may get a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. So really, the, the answer to that question is, is very gentle education um, across the board on some of the most fundamental concepts of this type of thing, just so it'll change the thinking of, of uh, it may change the thinking of the culture um, in open source software. Does that make sense? Yeah, I suppose later in the series, we can get into some examples where people who are interested in, you know, learning a little bit to have a big impact and really jump into learning the real basics, hopefully through the series and other resources in order to, yeah. um, in order to make a big difference without a significant amount of effort, more so just designing applications in the first place to have some of these concepts in mind, especially if you have a broad target audience. Right. So there's um, one more like little aside, but it's not really an aside because it's a pretty big point uh, that I want to make. And that's kind of what I alluded to earlier regarding kind of art and science and how UI UX really works within that, uh, how, how it's both. Um, so there's a big misconception about design and designers is that design is very, um secondary like right we we want to make the plumbing first and we want to get that right and good and well and then we can put the design on it and and people treat design like wallpaper or like paint that you put on an already finished product to make it look pretty and it really is not that way right design is is not the um is not veneer to to quote um Aral, who is a uh, UI UX designer that I really respect, Aral something or other. I mean, I can link his his article that is titled "That Design Is Not Veneer." It's not something you put at the be at the end. It's actually something that starts at the very beginning, where you identify the people that you're trying to um, work with and how are these people thinking. So when you're designing the screens, when you're designing the flows, when you're designing how is this person actually going to spend the money, when you're designing how is this person going to get from this screen to this screen. Right. Even before any of this is coded, as you're still blocking out this application or whatever it might be, you're thinking you're getting into these people's minds. How are they going to get from this screen to this screen? OK, it's via this button. Does this button make sense in placement, in color, in anything? Right. So design is actually from the ground up. You're planning this thing. Like It's like you're building a blueprint. You don't start building a house before you have a blueprint. You don't start building the plumbing before you understand what you're building before everybody is on board with what's going on here. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about design. It's not just the painting on the walls, it's the blueprint of where the walls are actually going to go before the construction workers come in and actually start building it. And then yes, there is painting on the walls afterwards. And there is, it, it, that actually does play an important role um, because if all the walls are painted bright yellow, then the house is gonna be very uncomfortable to be in, right? So, you, um, but design is, is um, is actually a lot in the beginning of the process and throughout the process and in the end of the process. And it's very iterative. So it's throughout the entire thing. It's not just at the end there. Um, and I think that's a misconception that is very prevalent among uh, hardcore developers, you know, the open source space. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll just put this bootstrap framework and, you know, everything will work. And and they didn't take the time in the beginning to think through all of their flows. And all of those things are part of user experience. Um, and the scientific aspect comes when you realize that design not being veneer is actually not subjective at all. 
right? So when we're painting walls and I say it should be blue and you say it should be green, well, that's kind of just opinion based, right? Who, what color we like most. But design is actually not opinion based. There is objectively better design and sub and objectively worse design. It's not, there's no subjectivity there. And as an example, let's say with a Monero wallet, my goal is to get users to spend Monero as fast as possible with as with as little confusion as possible. Every single application has a, a goal that the user wants to accomplish when they enter the application. And if a button color change from blue to green or vice versa will help the user accomplish their task faster and with less confusion, then it is objectively better design and the change should be made. There's no opinion pieces about it. Somebody could say, well, I think this, that it shouldn't be changed, at which point you point to the evidence and you say, but through our testing, we found that the users were able to blah, 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 blah. So it should be changed. At that point, opinions are irrelevant because we have uh, we have the testing to to prove it. And so there is a scientific process that goes into that. Um, and typically it's known as A-B testing, right? The, the ability to serve some things to some users and other things to other users and see which ones accomplish things better, faster, um, harder, better, faster, stronger, right? Um, and you use something like that to to see what's actually happening out in the wild and how people are actually using these things and get a better understanding um, of how to improve the user experience and to how to improve the interface, how to improve the interface for the user so that way they have a better experience. So none of this is none of this is subjective and it's very scientific in nature where you start where you when you really start getting down to the nitty gritties and you start seeing, okay, do we have reasons? All design needs justification. Do we have reasons that this is placed here? and not over here? Do we have reasons that this menu is present? Do we have reasons that this is not an automated task, but we're making them manually do it? Everything has to have a justification. And if the justification is shrugging shoulders, I don't know, or well, that's the way we've always done it, or well, that's the way it, the project that I forked from did it and I haven't had time to change it. Those are not real justifications. Everything has to have a reason for existence. You don't just throw a picture of a truck randomly inside of something. Why? Because the use, even though you think it looks cool, because the user is going to get into that menu system, look at that truck and think to themselves, wait, what's going on here? What is this supposed to represent? Am I, am I in a different application? You know, is this truck supposed to represent that it will take me somewhere? There's extra cognitive load. Every single thing that you add onto a design adds cognitive load. It's something that the user has to take in, make sense of. And if we just you know, throw elements here willy nilly anywhere without any justification. If we, if we make this blue, if we make this green, if we make another button, that's something that they have to process. And ultimately, we've all seen really bad interfaces where there's just way too much to process at once. We just get so lost and you just kind of maybe just give up or you have to power your way through. But it's a struggle. It's not a pleasure to use these types of applications. And we don't we don't want to do that. We don't want to burden our users with things that they shouldn't be burdened with. We want them to have to accomplish their goals as fastly, efficiently as possible with the least amount of confusion as possible. Now, I, I want to shift gears a little bit here. So, you know, I have been using a lot of technological talk, you know, um, well, UI, UX in technology, but it's important and fascinating to realize that absolutely everything in our life has a user experience. Everything, everything in the world has a user experience. When you open a door, you put your hand on the doorknob and you turn it, right? And that you're opening the door, you're using something. And maybe, maybe a doorknob is um, designed very poorly or it's the incorrect one for the job. And I'll give an example of this. We all know that there is a sort of door attachment for opening a door by pushing, right? It's that bar and you kind of push it in and it pushes. And then there's also one for pulling, right? And it's that handle and that you grab on and you pull it. Now we've all been to those buildings where they have a handle, which is for pulling. And there's a sign that says push. And so you grab the handle and you push it. And the door opens and you're thinking to yourself, why didn't they use the push bar door handle? Right? Why they, they don't need this sign <laughs> if they would have put something that makes sense to use here. And so that's that's a user experience, right? Because first of all, if they don't have that sign, then what do you do? You go to the door handle, you grab it, and you pull it. And it doesn't open because it's supposed to be pushed. And 
So you're like, oh, okay. Then you push it and it works. This is not intuitive design. This actually, I'm going to move into the definition of intuitive here. You'll often hear the word intuitive when it comes to design. What is it like this? This is not intuitive. This is intuitive. What, what is the definition of intuitive? <laughs> a really good definition of intuitive that I have heard that I subscribe to myself is a trial and error of one. So obviously when, when I give a new interface to somebody that they've never seen before and they have a goal in mind, because they've never seen this before, they will have to do trial and error, right? Now, if it's very confusing, nothing is labeled, then they're going to have to do a lot of clicks to try to find where they want to go. So this is a trial and error and they have to do it multiple times. A trial and error of one means that the design is so self-evident that if I want to get to the send screen, it's properly labeled, it's in a place that makes sense, right? Click and I'm there. I have never been to this interface before, but I did one thing and I got where I wanted to go. That is intuitive design. And so with this example of the, the door handle where you pull it first, you've tried once and it failed. Then you push and now it works. You've tried twice. So it's only twice, but it's not once. So it's not an intuitive design. So everything, everything that we have, that we use, that we touch, that we interact with in this world has a user experience about it, right? Maybe there's a coffee mug where the, the handle is too small and you've got big hands. So, okay, you're, you're not able to use that well. Um, maybe, you know, a keyboard is not very ergonomic. So that way you type on it for a couple hours, as is your job, and your wrist starts hurting. You're like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Or a mouse or, you know, a, a painting on a wall, anything, everything. That's the point. Everything has a user experience behind it. Um, and I encourage you, you know, as, as UX practice, I guess, right? Because part of the practice is learning what's frustrating to use. Where do I get frustrated? Where is like, God, come on, where, where is this option? Where is this thing? And not just on your computer programs, but everything. Find the little annoyances of life. Find your little annoyances in everyday life. When you sit down, when you stand up, when you go to bed, when you brush your teeth, find the things that annoy you. And see, is this a user experience problem? If this was tweaked, how, how would you make it better? If I was to tweak it in this way, if I was to add this handle, if I was to add this button, if there was to be this sign, then it would be better. Then everything would make sense. And a lot of money, a lot of businesses have been made on this idea where something is frustrating to people just because of bad user experience. And somebody's like, oh, I have an idea how to fix this. They do it. And all of a sudden, it becomes a wildly popular product. It's everywhere. Right. So you, you think of something like Netflix. Netflix used to not do streaming services. They used to mail DVDs. So you would go to their website, you'd go to their thing, you'd say, OK, um, I haven't seen this movie. Right. So you uh, you request that movie. They send it to you in a DVD. You watch it however many times you want. And then you send it, you mail it back. Right. Now, sometimes the DVDs were scratched when you got them, so they wouldn't work. Sometimes, you know, you might get a late fee because it's not your fault. It's the carrier's fault because they, they lost the DVD, whatever. So Netflix, you know, they, they're trying different things and they, they try this streaming service. Um, and for the first couple of years, like nobody really knew it existed. When you ask people, what would improve your experience here? They would say, make sure my DVDs are not scratched. They wouldn't, they're, they're not thinking way outside the box in terms of uh, what, if, what if I was able to watch things on my computer and I don't even need DVDs? I'd be able to watch anything that I want on demand, right? They're, talk, they're, they're still thinking in this DVD paradigm. Um, but people saw, okay, this is a pain point for, there's, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of potential for pain points here. What if we can streamline this process? And now we have streaming services. We have Amazon streaming services, Netflix streaming services, streaming services everywhere, just because it really caught on, right? So um, I guess pulling all this together, taking a step back and bringing all of this together, is this idea that everything is has a user experience and everybody watching this should go try to identify these things because that's going to give you practice. And if you have, you know, if you used open source software or other programs, this obviously applies to technology too, you know, the Monero software, and you're like, God, this was frustrating or this isn't working as I intended to. The, the load times are too long. The, the, this menu system doesn't make sense. These are all UX issues. Um, many times there are UI UX issues. There are UI UX issues, sorry, because they are interface issues. But like that loading screen time thing, it, it's, a, it's a UX issue. So um, how do we test this? How do we test this? 
Uh, I alluded to one earlier, you know, with A-B testing. It's really important to understand how these things can be tested because maybe I think it works well and you think it works well, but we're kind of of the same mind. We're in the same group, right? We need a way to see whether other people can use this thing well. And there, there's um, there's a few ways to do this. Some of them are not going to be popular in the Monero community. Some of them would be more popular. Like the the way that gives you the best results, the most accurate results, I guess I should say, is fairly privacy invasive. It's the type of thing where the app records every tap that you do in the background without telling you that it's doing it because that's seeing people use it in real life, in the wild. It's seeing the mistakes that they make. It's seeing that, okay, they click this menu before they click this menu and found the thing that they were looking for, right? And so that's fairly invasive. You know, you you need people's permission. That that Honestly, that's a lot of when, when it says, would you like to send anonymous data to this, this, this? That's what they're doing. They're seeing how you're using the application. Um, I don't know of any Monero person who would be a fan of putting that inside of the Monero wallets and stuff. It doesn't sound like something that would fly well in the community. Um, so the next best thing is to, you know, one of the other benefits of, of that other thing is it's essentially free, right? You don't have to pay anybody to do it. Um, and you're just collecting that stuff. And it's, it's basically free. Um, whereas one of the next things we can do is we can get a group of people um, that are hopefully within our target audience, which means if our target audience is everybody, we need a very big variety of people to, to try this, right? Um, and we sit them down either on the computer or on their phone or on whatever. And we say, okay, your goal is to do this. So maybe we'll say your goal is to give your Monero address to somebody so that way you can receive Monero. Here's the home screen, go, right? And we see, we, we watch them and we see as they're clicking around and they're going, eh, eh, eh. We see what, what are the screens that confuse people the most? Where, what parts of the interface do people spend the most time struggling to comprehend as they're reading it, as they're reading the words, you know, as they're understanding the interface? Um, this is a decent method. It's, it's hard for several reasons. One, you have to incentivize people to come in and do this thing right? Maybe that involves gift card giveaway, you know, a raffle, uh, paying people directly. Um, and it's a little bit more expensive on people's time because they're not using the app because they want to use it. They're using it because they're a part of a test as well. When you're kind of, there, there's a sort of test mentality that when they're sitting there, they're, they're, they're thinking they're, they're, there's a shift that the results can be skewed because each of these people know they're being tested. So maybe they'll try to be a little bit more intelligent in each of their clicks, or maybe they'll feel a little bit more anxious and nervous and things will take actually a little bit longer because they're a little bit stressed out. So the, the results can be uh, skewed slightly versus the other method where we put it in by default and the, the user doesn't see it because at that point they're just using it like they normally would as opposed to giving them a, a fake goal. Um, but that requires a good amount of money. You are going to have personnel that need to be there to staff the things, to make sure that people are using it, that they're not screwing up your computers, all those different kinds of things, right? And so it, as we start moving towards these ways to test, we're going to start seeing why open source software, maybe it's not that people don't want it to have good UX, but they just don't have the resources, whether it's financial or human, to do this kind of iterative testing. And if you don't have this natural empathy, this natural psychology of how people work through things, then it will be hard. Maybe you you do want it to have good UX. You are cognizant of these things, but you realize that you yourself, it's not one of your strong points. You're going to design it the best that you can. But then after that, you don't have the resources or the money or the whatever to, to test it and make sure that it actually is as good as you hope it will be. So maybe in open source, it's not hostile to UX. It just doesn't have the resources to do so because this takes a good amount of money and takes a good amount of time. Right? How many open source software developers who already spend their free time coding this for other people to use are going to rent out a room or bring people into their house and, and get them, make sure that it's, it's representative of their target audience and make sure and watch all these people go through their software program. That's a huge commitment, man. Not a lot of people do that, right? Nobody's going to, nobody's really going to be doing that. Um, so what was, so Diego, what can like small open source projects that don't have significant amount of resources do in order to get at least as much of the basics there as they can how can how can they take the leap into that 
initial testing process? Suppose right now they're not doing any testing. What's one small thing they can do that doesn't really take that much resources overall that can make the biggest difference? I guess besides what I've already mentioned of learning the foundations of all this different stuff, one of the things that you can do is find big softwares that are similar to your software in, in purpose and see what they have done. Now, this doesn't mean that they're going to have great UI UX, right? But they will probably have more resources and money to pour into something like this. It's really is a shame that a lot of this research, because they do research, they do this iterative A-B testing. It really is a shame that this stuff is not open sourced. I mean, it makes sense from a business perspective why, but it really is a shame that a lot of this stuff is not open source for everybody to learn from, because ultimately we want, um, we want just UI UX across the board everywhere to just improve, right? But in doing so, then some people might lose their competitive edge or their business edge, because maybe they, they, they sunk a million dollars into making their interface the absolute best it can be. Yeah. But the coolest thing that you can do is like, let's say you use an Adobe product like Photoshop, right? You So you use it, you see how it's good, you see how it's bad, what frustrates you. And then you can go onto like their support forums and stuff like that. Because one of the benefits of trying to outsource support to the community is that you see a lot of pain points for people when they're using this product. They'll say, hey, this isn't working for me or this is this is really annoying. Can we improve this, right? So you can go onto uh, forums or you can uh, look at reviews for different softwares that are in the same field as yours. And you can see not just what they have done right, what frustrates you um, and what doesn't frustrate you, but also what where other people are being frustrated. And that stuff is is fairly accessible on the internet. It's time intensive. You know, going through all these forums and stuff like that, but and maybe you could spend that time coding or doing anything else. Um, but it's going to um, bring a a better, more cohesive understanding from people who have sunk more money than you and more time than you into understanding how users are using this type of software. And the cool thing is, the really cool thing is, when you start doing this for a bunch of different projects or from a bunch of different areas of life, you start to notice patterns things that consistently trip people up, even on piece, even on things that have nothing to do with each other, right? So you can have a Photoshop type thing over here and you can have a money management thing over here and you'll see that, oh, both of these things have a button in an area that's a certain color and it's tripping people up. So even though the, the goals of these two applications are so different, you see similarities in confusion based on design choices, based on chunking of information, based on font choice, right? I can have an unreadable font and it can be in a Moneros wallet software. It can be in a video game. It can be anywhere. And it's just going to lessen the user experience of everyone involved because they won't be able to read it, right? So there's, there's going to be some common things across the board that you're going to um, start to see and patterns that you're going to start to see. And after you start to understand those patterns, that's naturally going to start moving into your, into your work. Um, it, yeah. it, it does take time. It does one, take one time. Really, one really basic example that you already gave earlier is the idea of wait time. It doesn't really matter what application you're using. Most people don't enjoy long wait time. So that's an example where you can learn that from any number of applications, not necessarily ones that are only related to you. And you know, the funny thing is, um, not all the time, but sometimes... Wait times are caused, well, because the longer the wait time, the more resources you're pulling from the computer, which may mean that you're you're trying to put a lot of things on screen. You're trying to pull, pull a lot of libraries, you know, like especially like with websites, you're thinking, okay, they're, they're loading a lot of JavaScript. They're doing a lot of things. And the funny thing is the interfaces are also not bad because they're, the interfaces are also bad. Sorry, they're quite poor because they're pulling so many things in. So if you radically simplify... Not only is that going to improve your interface, it makes it easier for people to understand, but it's also going to improve your wait times because you're pulling in less things. Um, but that's kind of one pattern that that starts to become pretty evident. It's like, oh, actually, simplicity is something to shoot for. You know, it maybe it's it's beneficial to have something for power users to use, right? And Monero has a lot of options. We got sub address generation. We got integrated address stuff. We have the ability to sign uh, messages with uh, our private keys and. Uh, check transactions and there's all this different stuff and it's really cool stuff, right? Um, is it worth it to have something for power users and not for power users? And, you know, we'll, we'll explore this more as we get into future episodes. But um, th these are things to just kind of start thinking about. How do we test? How do we look through these different types of things? You know, so, so you know, 
kind of moving back to that last question there, how do we test? We talked about A-B testing. Um, we talked about kind of anonymous, anonymized, so they say, uh, ways that people use the app kind of in the background. Uh, we talked about the, the kind of lab setup environment. The, the last way I want to touch on is the least reliable way, but is fairly cheap. And that is kind of this survey system where you, you say, how, how was your experience with this application? Right. Um, but this can be implement, uh, <clears throat> and you could say, how was your spending experience? How was your receiving experience? Um, what, where do you say you get frustrated? Um, these can be unreliable. Anyone who does any amount of science knows that any sort of self-reporting surveys as is, is, uh, has tendency towards bias, has tendency towards being incomplete because human memory is incomplete, which is why real-time uh, statistics gathering is generally uh, more uh, looked at looked at more positively. Uh, but also, these results can be skewed. As an example, let's say in an application that I make, I program it so that way the survey, how do you like your experience, only happens after a successful transaction is sent. Well, the user has just accomplished their goal. So probably more likely the experience will be good, right? Whereas if I, if I um, program the survey pop-up to appear if a transaction has failed, okay, well, the user's goal has just not been accomplished. So they may be more likely if they accept the survey or something to give it a low score. So if you implement surveys incorrectly or at the wrong places or at the wrong times, um, not only are the surveys themselves annoying, as most of us know, whenever there's a big pop-up, it's like, hey, do you want to take the survey? Like, no, go away. I'm trying to do something, right? Not only are the surveys themselves annoying, but um, depending on where you place them, how you go about them, or you know, how they're designed, it can give you skewed results and that are quite inaccurate. And obviously, the longer the survey, the more information it's going to give you, but the more annoying it's going to be on the user and the less likely it is that they're going to take it. So there's this kind of balancing act that shows up here. So it's cheap, right? If somebody says, I won't accept the survey, well, that's free to you. If they say that you, they will accept the survey and they take it, that's pretty much also free to you. Great. So as the developer, that doesn't, um, that doesn't cost a lot of time or money. So as an open source developer, honestly, maybe that might be one of the best things that we have. It's not great, but it's, um, it's also kind of what we got. There are some open source projects that do say is, can we send anonymized data, right? Like Riot and Matrix. Um, they ask if they can send this anonymized data to kind of improve their products. Um, and, you know, you may opt out of that or you may opt into that or whatever. Some open source projects are doing that because they realize the, the benefits of this information. What I would like to see is more open source projects take this information and, and the, all this data that they've gleaned and open source the data, open source the research, not just their software, but this research about how people are using their stuff and the, the confusion that people have. So that way everybody can benefit from it as we're making new applications. I think that really is the next step in terms of UI UX. Right now, we have open source UI UX in the sense that you can see the, the things that I've done and you can make edits for yourself, right? But in terms of the research, oftentimes that's kept secret for commercial reasons, or even it's just not open source because people don't realize the value in that kind of thing. They don't realize how, how valuable that actually is to the community at large. So if anybody's watching this as a... Um, whoever you are, you know, developer of, of whatever you have, uh, whether it's open source or commercial, I encourage you do something for the good of the community for once in your life. And <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, do something good for the community and open source this research, open source this data. Um, obviously, it's hard to open source data, especially if there is um, data that can be identifying to individuals that's not properly anonymized, or even if it's anonymized, people may be less likely to opt in because they don't want any of their stuff kind of out there. There's always this balancing act that goes on here. Anyway, UI UX is kind of the first episode. It's kind of the first thing we wanted to talk about. What is it? Why is it important? Um, how do we test it? What what is the goals of this? You know, and, and kind of touching on the objectivity of it as a as a field and as a as a um, yeah as a field. The other word escapes my mind. So, any questions from you, Justin? Not particularly. I think you did a good job covering the basics of UI UX. UI is an important part of UX, but it's not the full experience for how a user is interacting with 
either a piece of software or a door handle, whatever it might be. Right. And uh, the, the importance of people who are designing the software or anything in particular to have an initial understanding of what people are looking for, just a, an idea to introduce why people should care about making a decent set of software for the users they're targeting and just having even a small focus in that area can really reduce a lot of pain points in the future. And then I appreciate the focus on how you can go about testing whether what you did works or not and how you need to justify why you're doing things in certain ways, especially as a product beco becomes more advanced, more mature, that way that uh, the software or the product or whatever it might be has a better justification for why it's doing things, has a better overall user experience for people, and how you get away from the subjectivity of it, you know, one color versus another color, you can say, okay, this color is better for this reason, because based off our testing, people felt much more comfortable with a light theme, so to speak, compared to a dark theme. So those sort of things, I think, are really important to think about at a really high level with UI, UX. I hope that whoever's watching this has a better understanding of the basics and has an incentive to go out and even if they don't want to jump full into UI, UX, um, as far as a full-time profession, even if they're working on other things, can get a good initial understanding of these topics so that they can they can improve what they're doing, whatever it is, in relation to the ultimate understanding of UI, UX, because typically we build systems for some people. So if, if, if I want to build something that anyone else, that I have the expectation that anyone else wants to use, it's good to design it with those individuals in mind and have a good initial experience so that there's less work in the future. So thank you, Diego, for you know, deciding that you wanted to share your knowledge on UI, UX, I think it was a very, very useful foundation. What's coming up next in the future episodes? Yeah, so uh, we're, the next episode, we're going to be specifically focusing on technology and open source, kind of this, um, this whole open source scene. And we're going to delve into this idea of goals, um, particularly prioritizing we have in user experience, we prioritize for goals, right? And we think it's the goal of the user, but maybe it's the goal of the business, right? Because they want to make money or they want you to click on the thing to buy their thing. Um, and so when you design, you're designing for the goal of the business or for the goal of the user and this balance that comes between the two. And we're going to look at how that balance is kind of upended in open source and how open source has a very unique opportunity um, in this balance to disrupt the system that is more and push more towards the, the user goals. Um, so we're going to kind of look at commercial UI UX and uh, open source UI UX and mostly in the technology field. And after that, we're going to move into cryptocurrencies at large. So things like Bitcoin, um, things like, you know, we can talk about Ethereum, IOTA, whatever people want to talk about. And we're not going to discuss the technical merits of these projects. We're going to discuss the, the user interface and experience based on what they're trying to do and, and how that's Good. And, and then we're going to be looking at the ecosystem at large. Finally, finally, I know this is a Monero series. We're going to be touching on kind of UI UX in Monero, the wallets that do exist, things that we could be doing better as an ecosystem, things that some things have done really well. And we'll have some really great examples from that. Um, one thing I do want to say that we that is outside the scope of these conversations is the, the nitty gritty, the particulars, the technicalities of UI UX. So I'm never going to start talking about what typography should, be, should you be using? Which fonts should you be using? What colors should you be using? How should you chunk information? Like all that stuff, how to do the actual um, work here beyond the, the higher level ideas. There's plenty of courses online. There's plenty of you know college courses, Coursera courses, whatever that you can start going through to get a better understanding of how, this, of how you would go about constructing good UI UX, right? Good interfaces and, and can, making a good user experience for your users. Um, but that's out of the scope of what we're gonna be doing uh, here. All right. Thanks, Diego. Is there anything else you want to leave the viewer with for this initial episode? No, go have great lives. Be great people. All right. Thank you, Diego, for kicking off the series with me. We are happy that you took the time to listen to this first episode, and we hope to see you in future episodes learning about UI UX in general and in technology and cryptocurrencies, and then finally in Monero. Take care, everybody.